I was discussing these changes a little bit with one of our previous guests who was also from uh, Odessa, Kate Levchuk. Oh, sh- oh, I know. Yeah, no, Kate. Yeah. And uh, she was talking about how it has been changing since the war because previously the Russian language was the the main language that, re- that was used there back in 2014 when, um, when Russia annexed uh, Crimea. Right. Uh, there was initially this idea about Novorossiya. Right. That the, they were trying to not just go for the Donbass, but they were trying to go all the way to the Romanian border and make Ukraine a landlocked country. Sure. And naturally, Odessa was... Uh, Would have been the capital of Novorossiya, right? Yeah. So then, of course, there were there was the famous... Um, Incident in uh, the trade union uh, house, I believe, yes, as well. Yes, yeah, in May, uh, yeah, in yes, in May, in May, in May of, 2014. Right. And um, here, what what was? I don't know if you were in the city at the time in 2014. I was not actually. I was so, I was in the country, but somewhere else. It, the The trade union house incident for mm-hmm. for our, our viewers and listeners who don't know about it, there was a fight which was instigated by Russian intelligence. Obviously, it was it was obviously a false flag operation in order to create an incident, a physical incident where the Russians could uh, pull off the same kind of stunt that they got going in Donetsk and Lugansk successfully, right? Uh, th- those operations were put down in Dnipro and Kharkiv and Odessa by Ukrainian patriots, and, and rightly so. Yes, uh, there are these videos where you can see this Russian crew uh, with standing with guns and shooting with guns behind police lines, so to say. So early on in the day before they got to the trade 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 union house. Yeah, yeah. It was it's a it's a really yeah, I didn't think we'd talk about this, mm-hmm. but it, just very briefly, it was a contrived incident with uh at the time the police in Odessa was not entirely loyal to the Ukrainian state. Mm-hmm. I, right after that incident, they came down from Kiev and they reformed the police and they put they put loyal officers on in, on the top of a hierarchy of the of the uh, police, and also people from uh, Transnistria, from the Moldovan Russian base, mm-hmm. there came in, and, and Russian saboteurs, uh, spies, uh, security guys. This was a organized Russian intelligence mm-hmm. operation in order to create a pretext for some sort of incident that they could roll in and take over Odessa, right? The way they they did As successfully. Gherkin Indian- had done in Slavyansk yeah. just just previously, and yeah, 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 and in Crimea, actually too. The, the Ukrainians got lucky that Ukrainian local patriots fought back. There was a running battle between, uh, let's say, pro-Russian proxy settlers, set, you know, separatists, whatever mm-hmm. you want to call them, and Ukrainian patriots. And the Ukrainians got lucky and they were lobbying uh, Molotov cocktails at each other and uh, the trade union fire uh, right in the middle of Kulikov Polya, mm-hmm. the Kulikov Field, there's this big trade unionist house. Very important historically in Odessa, and the Russian guys, mm-hmm. let's call them that, were herded in there. They and, were, uh, yeah, they were in the building, and they which were caught yes, fire. It caught fire, and they were they were throwing grenades out of a mm-hmm. window. The guys outside were throwing grenades. It was a mm-hmm. firefight, yeah. you know, a fist fight, and firefight. And how yeah. has Odessa changed after that? How how has it been ever since? There hasn't really been any type type of large scale violence, from what I've at least heard, ever since. There there have been. Attempts to foment, but never mm-hmm. nothing ever happened. The Ukrainian intelligence and counterintelligence services are actually mm-hmm. fairly good. The SBU mm-hmm. in uh, the SBU in Odessa, even though that they are not entirely under the control of the central uh, authorities, are good at, mm-hmm. at, at at that kind of counter uh, intelligence operation there, and they, they they take care of that sort of thing down there. And how how was the situation back in uh, 2022 in February? Because initially the Russian advance from Crimea was very quick. They took Melitopol quickly. Yes. They crossed the Dnipro River. Yes. They were heading to Mykolaiv. Yes. And then in front of Mykolaiv, they got stopped. But technically from Mykolaiv to Odessa, it's very close. It's by one side. hour. I imagine people in Odessa must have been on edge, to say the least. I was, I mean, I was there. I was reporting from there. I went to see the mayor, Truhanov, who has a reputation, rightly or wrongly, as a gangsterish character who who can switch sides mm-hmm. uh, on, on a dime, and he really went in on being a patriot and and just ran around screaming obscenities, and mm. will, they will not pass. I was there. I was there in March of two thousand and twenty two and it, the battles were still ongoing, not so far away from Odessa. I mean they were they were evacuating, you know 
anti-tank stuff that was in the middle of the city to, to bring it to, to... Yeah, these hedgehogs on yeah, the yeah, streets yeah, yeah. and on the beaches. Yeah, yeah, there were hedgehogs in the streets and the, 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 the city was mined and the, the beaches were mined. We were expecting uh, Russian marine assault on the... On the on the beaches, uh, ultimately, I think the Russian Marines mutinied and refused to go mm. because they didn't want to die on the beaches and they were, would have been shot up on the beaches. They didn't want to repeat Hostomel at the beach this time. Hostomel on the beach, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly right. I, I I was told by a Ukrainian general who's in command at the time in the south that uh, the Russian Marines mutinied and they mm. refused to go, and ultimately, by the time that the Moskva battleship had sunk. Mm. The Russians couldn't operate from the sea on the, on the, on the south close enough to the, to the maritime border to, to make marine landings. Yeah. Or to, so by by about April of last year, the real danger to Odessa had passed, although it was a real and substantive danger. And it's not the case that the Ukrainians would have been able to hold it if the if the Russians had gone in faster. They had, if they had concentrated their troops and, and advanced faster in the south, they very well could have pass through Nikolaev. Nikolaev, at certain points when I was there, when it was still getting bombed in uh, May of last year, it looked like it could have fallen and the Russians just got unlucky. The Ukrainians often just do get lucky. Yeah. yeah. Also the governor, uh, Vitaly Kim, uh, was really oh, yeah, yeah. out on the front lines and mustering support for, for the cause and it seems like he was... Yeah, he's become a hero. Yeah, yeah Governor Kim of Nikolaev has become this really fantastical hero of, of a kind that Ukraine seems to have no problem in producing. But yeah, Odessa was almost almost mm. uh, on the front lines and it would have been really terrible. And if we go back to February 2022, uh, you had been going from and to Ukraine for many years, but in February 2022... You were there on a very special mission yourself. Uh, right now, in in the coming weeks, we have sure. the documentary by Sean Penn uh, that is about to be released, and uh, you had a right. certain part that you were playing in that as well. And uh, you spent some time with Mr. Penn, including uh, in, here in, in those days. Including here, <laughs> I, I took him to see the Polish Prime Minister last year in March, which was very memorable. Actually, I was spending all of January in Kiev along with the rest of the international journalist pack as we were waiting for the war to start. It was, it was obvious that it was going to start. I didn't, I didn't think that they would attack that stupidly. In fact, I, I'm on record um, in the film asking Sean Penn and the other journalists we were having dinner on, on the 22nd of February. And I said, do you think Kiev's going to be on fire tomorrow? Famous last words. I didn't think that they would go directly into Kiev. I didn't think that it'd be that stupid. I really assumed that they were rational actors based on on their own real assessment mm. of their own capacity to fight. So there was a lot of misunderstanding, uh, miscalculation. A lot of people in Kiev misjudged their capacities, mm. and the Russians also misjudged. So we were sitting around waiting for the war to start for about a month. Well, the Olympics were rolling by, and it was obvious that the Russians wouldn't go in the middle of the Olympics. Their Chinese allies didn't like that. They said, please mm-hmm. don't do that. Wait for our show to conclude before you start your own show. Yeah. And I was hired as a producer on the Sean Penn Zelensky documentary by my friend Aaron Kaufman, who is the co-director and, and the executive producer, one of the executive producers of the, of the film. And Sean Penn was coming in and out of Ukraine filming for already like a year, but he had arrived back on the 21st of February, right? We kept calling him, you have to come, you have to come, something's going to happen. He arrived on the 21st of February. I set up dinner for him with myself and three well-known, other well-known journalists. This is a scene in the film. It's great. Mm-hmm. It's about ten minutes of us just yelling at each other about whether this is going to be a battle the next day or not. And I fa- and, I, and I famously, infamously, and Sean Penn, Sean Penn left this in the film. Uh, it's very funny. I I, I yelled at uh, uh, my friend Nolan Peterson, uh, American journalist, also like me now at the uh, Atlantic Council. I yelled him, yelled at him. Do you think that Kiev's going to be on fire tomorrow? Mm. <laughs> this is I yelled on February twenty second. I yelled yeah. this in the, in the at, uh, at 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 Nolan. And we had, a, we had a really nice time uh, and we had a really intense conversation. It was a really intense time. Mm. Heady, it was obvious that something was about to happen. The prime ministers from the Baltics, from Germany, from, from Poland were coming yeah. in and warning the Ukrainian government to stand up. And the Ukrainian government didn't want to create panic. Mm-hmm. So they were like, they were hedging. They didn't want to create an economic catastrophe. officially they were, yeah. 
They didn't want. I mean, they didn't want the po- the male population to flee. Yeah. They didn't want to tank the economy. They mm-hmm. thought that the, they thought this was just more pressure, clogging the roads, and yeah, yeah there yeah. are many problems that are associated with that type of panic that could happen if yeah, they they, they fought they fought that the mm. the real problem would have been a artificial panic and then a coup d'état by by Russian agents within within Kiev, which is a really legitimate fear, by mm-hmm. the way. That's not a that's not a crazy thing to be afraid of. That's a real that's a real way that the Russians could have taken power. They just miscalculated. And because they miscalculated, uh, ultimately the the nation came came together. Mm. I mean, I mean, uh, after after this war is over, we'll, we'll probably have a lot of recriminations about who did what and yeah. who could have done more. But yeah, we were hanging out with with Sean, mm. and uh, we did we did some interviews with uh, journalists, and we saw prime minister, the former prime minister, and the war. Starts on the 24th, but the night before, we're hanging out at the Hyatt, and he put on his black suit, and he put on his black skinny tie, he looked like a punk rocker, and he got into a black car to go see Zelensky. Mm-hmm. Uh, I said goodbye to him. I shook his hand. It was at 10 o'clock on the 23rd. He went to see Zelensky for the first time. Zelensky kept, had kept him waiting because yeah. he's a president. Mm-hmm. Even Sean Penn's not a head of state, right? Yeah. So he had just been waiting for the, for the meeting. Mm-hmm. And it just so happened that Zelensky... And Yermak had given him the 10.30 slot on the night of the mm-hmm. 23rd, five and a half hours before the bombing. Yeah. Surreal, right? Absolutely. And Zelensky promises, promises Sean Penn, tomorrow you start the film. Tomorrow you get your interview. Mm-hmm. Sean Penn comes back to the hotel, wakes up at four. I'd been told at two in the morning by my by a friend in the CIA that um, as I, I, had a, I had a Russian passport because I lived in Moscow in 91, which I uh, destroyed uh, immediately when the war started. But I didn't want to get picked up by mm-hmm. the by the um, SBU. Well, I didn't want anybody else. I didn't, I, there were a lot of people running around getting mm-hmm. randomly killed yeah. in the early week of of, of Kiev, mm-hmm. you know, 20, 22nd. February 25th, 27th. Yeah. Random, I mean, a minister that I know almost got shot because the uh, random vigilantes mm-hmm. fought. Hey, why is he driving around in a black Mercedes? Yeah. A minister in Zelensky's, in Zelensky's mm-hmm. government was dragged out of his car and almost shot by, by trigger-happy people. There were a lot of people shooting random guys all over the place. There were saboteurs. Yeah, people yeah. forget about these saboteurs, but... but we do remember that on the twenty yeah. fifth, twenty sixth, there yeah. were these images of people running around and shooting on the streets of Kiev. Oh, sh- yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there, there were there were saboteurs, mm. there were uh, plainclothes Russian agents. Uh, I, I got off track, but I'll get back to what I was about to say in, in, in a second. There were there were uh, all sorts of Russian sleeper cells, and there were all sorts of Russian plainclothes men. There were all sorts of Ukrainians who were on the Russian side. There were all sorts of. Uh, people within the uh, Ukrainian security agencies who were confused or had or had moles as 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 uh, um, as a boss, mm. and all sorts of people were getting shot and shot randomly. People at roadblocks were going crazy. Ukrainian patriots were shooting up cars mm-hmm. full of other Ukrainian patriots. I mean, like uh, hundreds and hundreds of people got shot randomly. I think there, there yeah. were a lot of weapons in circulation. We also remember this viral video of a truck showing up and just handing out totally. AKs. To it was time to whoever armless. wanted to take absolutely. An AK, yeah. They they opened up the armories and they said, okay, partisan warfare. Mm-hmm. Anyone can have a gun. I mean, there there were lots of incidents of, mm. of Ukrainian trigger happy Ukrainian guys mm. knocking down Ukrainian planes in the first in the first three days. I think we lost like eight planes in the first three days to friendly fire, and that friendly fire was guys with stingers or machine guns in mm-hmm. the street knocking down our own planes because we're, we're flying the same planes as the Russians, yeah. right? And so I I knew and I was warned mm. by various people since I uh, since I, my name is Vladislav and I, you know I'm, I'm a foreigner blah blah blah. There will be people who will take opportunities to kill people on the kill lists and also just uh, people uh, you know w- w- were shot randomly and also general i assumed chaos. yeah general chaos i assumed if i was, got picked up by the russians a uh, filtration camp and and uh, i um i would uh i i just assumed i didn't want to be picked up by the russians so i didn't i didn't flee but i i just took a car to a village behind ukrainian lines to see which way the, the lines would go mm-hmm. and then for two days I stayed put and then I moved along closer to the Belarus border and I reported from various places. I I just was told that I would uh, uh, not do well in the filtration camp by mm. various people 
various many 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 people told me that I would do very badly in a filtration camp. So it turned out to be correct. Mm. We, we every time the Ukrainian army retakes uh, a um, a uh, a village or mm-hmm. a city, we see what they did. Yeah. Right. And so Sean Penn goes to see Zelensky on the morning on the twenty fourth on the twenty fourth at eleven a.m. or about noon. Zelensky keeps his promise to Sean Penn. At, at this time, just to remind the viewers, we are seven hours or so into That's the right. war. Seven hours into the war, Sean Penn kept his promise. Uh, Zelensky kept his mm. promise to Sean Penn of the night before and gives him an interview. And he had already been transformed into the Zelensky we all now, know now, a, a world historical avatar of heroism and bravery and resilience and, and manliness and generosity. And the military fatigues. Yeah, yeah. He was war, already wartime president. He was already wartime president mm. and... Sean was just blown away. Sean Penn was just like uh, in a in a state of utter reverence, almost you know a kind of piety, which is utterly understandable when you when you see something like that, when you're around something like that, when you see that these people did not run away, that they did their duty, that they did it heroically and bravely and elegantly, with coolness and grace under fire. Um, Went looking for the ammunition, not yeah, for the ride. Not for the ride. And then I, I went to Chernowitz. I uh, helped various people who needed to be evacuated. Uh, evacuated. I, I did that for about a week. Then my wife said, "You can't go back to the front until you get our own family out." I crossed the border into Romania. I picked up my own relatives from Odessa. I got them to the Romanian embassy of, of France. I got them papers. I flew them to Paris and to Germany to France. I got my own relatives my own relatives um, out of the country, the ones that needed to be safe from Odessa and the Nikolaev region. And then I flew from America back here to Warsaw to meet up with Sean Penn to organize more parts of the film. I set up a, another scene in the film where, where he's hanging out with a bunch of former spooks, American former spooks. It's a great scene. And so Sean had a great time with these American spooks and uh, just, you know, r- red red team, red state American guys, uh, former IRI guys, CIA guys, hang out. And then I think it was early March, I took him to see your prime minister. And uh, it was a very nice scene in the film where they discuss F-16s mm-hmm. and Sean Penn is trying to get the, uh, the, the Polish prime minister to sell F-16s. <laughs> 